Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Pat, Mike Cortez, Urban Stir, and Clifford Deadmore. On this episode of DTNS, Google Translate gets a pretty big update. Instagram's new AI studio is going all in on chatbots. And Will Smith tells us about the future of RSS. Maybe it's back? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, June 27th, 2024. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us is Will Smith, host of the Brad and Will Made a Tech Pod, and also PC World video contributor. Hi, Will. Welcome back. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for having me. It's good to be back. It's good to have well, you. It's good to have you. Indeed. Indeed. We're going to talk, uh, well, we're going to talk about a lot of things today, <laughs> as, as we do on all shows. But let's start by doing that with the quick hits. Amazon announced on Thursday it's folding its Amazon Clinic telehealth service into its primary care business, One Medical. Amazon says that this will simplify its primary care offering for customers. The service has been rebranded Amazon One Medical Pay Per Visit and says it will offer more affordable per-visit uh, per pricing. Customers can pay $49 for a video visit call or $29 to text message a doctor. On Wednesday, Google said in a blog post that new Chrome actions have been added for mobile users to call, read reviews for, or get directions to a restaurant or other business directly from the address bar. The new features are available to Android users now and are coming to iOS users in the fall. Google also added a few other Chrome updates, including live sports cards in Chrome's Discover feed, and iOS users will also now see trending search suggestions in the Chrome address bar when they click on it from the new tab page. Xbox Cloud Gaming is coming to Amazon's Fire TV Sticks in July, which lets Xbox Game Past Ultimate subscribers stream a variety of games directly to their Fire TV devices. So just kind of a good, good, good thing between the two companies. Game Pass Ultimate streaming will also be available on Fire TV Stick 4K Max and Fire TV Stick 4K models for its Xbox app. It needs a Bluetooth-enabled controller and an active Xbox Game Pass Ultimate subscription. At last, Apple has added Rich Communication Services, or RCS, to its Messages app, now available to iPhone users running the second de developer beta of iOS 18. But Apple is implementing the GSMA standard version of RCS, not the Google Messages version. The RCS protocol in Messages will use the internet to receive files and high-quality images, see typing indicators, get read receipts, start group chats, and more, but it won't add additional features like end-to-end -end encryption provided within Google Messages. That's an Android users only feature support for rcs is support for rcs is in ios seems to be limited to the u.s carriers and have updated their network bundle for ios 18 for now and chats with users um that are on android will still show up with green bubbles oh man i, I thought this was all gonna be squashed i'm still gonna be green bubble bull <laughs> it's just it's okay you can green bubble me. That's fine. It was only a matter of time before Amazon took on fast fashion retailers Timu and Shein. Amazon is readying a launch of a new vertical dedicated to low-priced fashion and lifestyle items that will allow Chinese sellers to ship directly to U.S. customers. The storefront was announced at an invite-only conference for Chinese sellers on Wednesday. Amazon pitched it as cost savings for Amazon sellers in China and also said merchants would be able to test new items through small batch production. All right, let's talk about languages, shall we? Uh, we all speak a variety of languages, uh, English on this particular show, but, you know, some of us are, you know, bilingual, trilingual, um, and otherwise. Google announced Thursday that its translate tool that's been around forever is getting support for 110 new languages, almost double what it's previously supported. That was previously 133 languages. That brings the total to 243 languages. You might say, okay, what's going on here? Google's Palm 2 AI language model has helped translate 
the the platform translate learned these new languages and has apparently excelled in particular at learning ones that were related to another language but still had obvious differences google says some examples are things that are close to hindi like adwadi and marwadi french creoles like seychellois creole or mauritian creole Translate also now includes Cantonese. This is the big one because there are uh, around 87 million Cantonese speakers in the world. Google says that uh, was a challenge to many Chinese speakers who don't necessarily speak Mandarin, but they speak Cantonese, but it made it a struggle to find data and train models on Cantonese specifically. Most of the new languages are spoken by at least 1 million people, although several, again, Cantonese being one of them, are spoken by hundreds of millions of people. So I, I thought this was a, a, a cool and interesting story because, as you said, Sarah, Translate has been around forever, and they don't really update it all that often. So the fact that they were able to add 102, 110 new languages all at once was, you know, a pretty substantial move for them. And it seems like it's all being made by, you know, made made possible by Palm too. So the the AI is actually able to, in in cases where languages are similar to each other. Uh, you know, figure out how to make those translations, uh, you know, very quickly. So I, I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah, this is one of those places that I actually really like AI. I'm, I'm kind of a down on AI generally, but, but like making it easier for us to communicate with each other as a, as a species seems like a good thing. And it seems like a big win. 110 new languages. Good job. Yeah, I mean, I, as somebody who, <laughs> there was a point uh, in my life, and details not important, uh, but I, I was talking to somebody who spoke French, and I spoke English, and my French was pretty bad, and he didn't speak any English at all. And Google Translate actually made, uh, you know, our friendship pretty great. I mean, the, obviously, there's some context lost. But this is a tool that I've been using for for many, many years. Now, if I, yes, if, you know, if it would have been somebody who was like Cantonese, obviously I wouldn't have been able to use that until today. But um, I think that this goes beyond just sort of like, oh, I'm on vacation. I need to speak to a shopkeeper about, you know, something specific. I mean, obviously it's helpful for that. But I think, I think it actually, it really does remind all of us that, you know, uh, relationships, friendships, um, conversations span lots of languages. And the more we have at our fingertips, the better we all are off. The, the big surprise to me was that Cantonese wasn't already included. I didn't realize Which, that. And yeah. that was kind of shocking to me. I, me Which, too. I mean, 87 million is not an insignificant number of native speakers. Like my parents are both, uh, I mean, if you count Cantonese as a separate language, you know, my mom knows three, Shanghainese, Mandarin, and Cantonese. My ned, dad knows two others. Um, but, you know, one of the things that Google said was there, it, there, was, there is some overlap in the written language, and that's just a function of history. Um, but, you know, there, there, there are certain uh, uh, words and enunciations because we so tightly integrate, at least in, 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 in for us, you know, speak who speak English, we so associate our alphabet with the spoken language, and that's not the case for a lot of uh, uh, other languages like Chinese, which is uh, uh, kind of what do they call it? A, a log, not logarithmic, but a, a, a script that's based on on pictures and symbols rather than us uh, 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 um, uh, phonology or uh, phonetics. And so mm -hmm. there was some difficulty, and I think really the story here is how impressive. Palm 2 AI was in order to squeeze 110 new languages would have what would have been probably years of work if you were doing this by by human hands. Indeed, indeed. I totally agree with that. I I think that what seems what what uh what jumps out to me is there are languages that are somewhat similar to other languages, but there are also languages that are technically the same language as, you know, that next region over, but still colloquial uh, isms, very, very different. Um, I can think of an example, Swiss German, uh, as opposed to German German. I happen to have some family that lives in Switzerland and Swiss German is like not a written language, 
but and everyone who's in Switzerland can speak high German, but it's a different language. It's a different uh, uh, language uh, that you just you you know it or you don't. And something like Google Translate being able to pick up on that stuff because of a language model understanding over time. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Um, there are. The, this is the same language, but I see what this person is doing. I, I think that you know that counts for a lot. Did, did they talk about accuracy at all in this? Does the does the Palm Two model help improve accuracy at all, or is this just a pure numbers game? Like we're. I mean, quantity? I think it's accuracy in the sense of knowing that you know there there are maybe two regional languages being spoken based on one. Uh, yeah. mother language uh, type i mean i totally get what you're saying well like there there are there are certain words and concepts when you translate if you translate it literally it wouldn't make any sense but mm -hmm. if you understand what those two words are in that language and the thought or the the, the meaning you're trying to get across you would have a more accurate translation. The joke I always do is watching a Chinese language movie, and then I look at the English subtitles to say, "Oh, okay, so that's what they, that's what they're trying to get across when they say that." Because I have a different connotation when I see those particular words being said. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, your mileage may vary, uh, but uh, but yes, Google Translate uh, definitely uh, opening up uh, quite quite a few more languages for folks that couldn't use the service before. So uh, if you if you are one of these people um, or you have experience with this, please do let us know. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. So let's just change gears a little bit and talk a little bit about what Meta is doing uh, with Instagram. So Instagram is running a test of its new AI studio that will allow creators to make an AI chatbot version of themselves. As part of the test, you might start seeing AI from your favorite creators and interest-based AIs in the coming weeks on Instagram, according to CEO Mark Zuckerberg. These will primarily show up in messaging for now and will be clearly labeled as AI. You essentially will be able to have a conversation with a chatbot trained on data from a creator's Instagram account, allowing you to ask questions and hopefully get answers back that are not inaccurate or latent with profanity. Sarah, I believe you and Tom earlier this week talked about uh, what Google is doing with celebrities and, and, and chat bots with uh, even YouTube, uh, you know, creators. So are you going to be creating a Sarah bot anytime in the near future? <laughs> no. I just can't. I never say never. Uh, but I can't imagine what anyone, I mean, I don't know. My life is pretty open already. Like what would the chat bot do for me? But I'm not, I, you know, I, I would not consider myself like, a really big influencer. So for the, this is the question that Tom and I, we kicked around on Tuesday a little bit. And I was like, I just don't, I don't get, uh, besides sort of the, the initial, like, Oh, wow. You know, the Will Smith chatbot just got back to me and said something that sounded like how Will would talk to me. It's like, how 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 far does this go? Well, this feels like a novelty thing to me. So so the example I got when I asked a friend who's working on one of these things at, at a company that we haven't talked about today uh, was, hey, I'm a makeup influencer and I have questions. And I'm a viewer of makeup channels and I have a question about what oh, makeup to buy for one. my skin type yeah. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That was the only good example they gave. The rest of them were all really bad and like parasocial and weird. So like, yeah. I, I just, yeah, it's like it's like what yeah. if if I really okay, let's just say I was like, okay, I'm all in on this AI studio thing. I'm going to make a chatbot. Like, what would someone ask me that I couldn't just answer in an email? I'm not sure. And maybe I'm just maybe I'm missing the point of, you know, our new normal, but I don't know. D D Rob, what do you think? So so I have a, a take on this, and I, I, I just wonder about this. If, if I'm a creator and I have a, a following that is big enough that, that Meta would allow me to create a chat bot that could answer questions based off things that I've said before, my question is, would, as the creator, would I actually want that question to be asked in the social media platform that I don't control? It seems to me like mm. I would much rather have if you have a question for me, go to my community, go to my email, go go somewhere that I actually have a little bit of control over and ask me the question there and I'll get back to, you know, maybe I would want to build a chat bot there. 
But I'm just I'm, I'm kind of wondering, I, you know, I, I am definitely not a big time influencer or creator on social media. But I do know that if I have people who are asking me questions, I don't know that I want those to live inside of the social media world. I, I'd probably want them to be on my own platform. Well, and I, I think you're exactly right, Rob. And the thing I don't the thing I don't want is the machines like we've spent a lot of time teaching computers to be useful and, 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 you know, do math and things like that. We're now working on teaching them to lie. And I don't want the machine that looks like me and sounds like me to be taking over lying when I spent a lot of time not lying to my, to my viewers. So yeah, yeah I don't know. I, this feels like a, this is something I'm never going to sign up for, but I'm old and, and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, I, I believe in the truth. So what do I know? Yeah, one of the things that uh, Meta is concerned about is accuracy and and profanity. They they say that all over the the postings. All, you know, Mark Zuckerberg actually had a video where he's talking about this, and those are some of the things that he mentions that you know work with us. You know, it's going to take time to get it right, which is a true statement. It is going to take time to get it right, but I just kind of question the whole thing. This is one of those areas where I don't see the ultimate benefit of this. I see the feature, I don't see the benefit. At least not yet. Maybe you know, maybe I think, Meta can I do think, a better job of showing me. I think your uh, example, Will, of the makeup artist makes perfect sense for this. It's like, oh, of course. You know, the makeup artist might just, you know, be inundated with too many, you know, you know, what's the best color or, you know, how do I, you know, make my brows different? You know, all, all the makeup things. A chat bot uh, that is based on information coming from that creator makes perfect great sense. If you are doing, well, I don't know, flower arrangement, like there are certain things that I think are very tactile and make sense for this. I would say, yeah, you know, if someone wanted to ask me about expertise, I, it would probably be about podcast production, which also could be very valuable to somebody but at the same time, I'm like, yeah, I, don't, I, I would want to curate that a lot more myself because I don't want to I don't want some chatbot telling somebody to do something that wasn't specifically what I wanted them to know about it, me. And, and that's the thing is I don't I'm incredibly skeptical of the chatbot even trained on thousands of hours of content to be able to produce the same kind of output that I would like if somebody asked me, Hey, what microphone should I buy for a podcast? I would listen to their voice and I would ask them what kind of podcast they're going to do. Are they going to do it in a studio? They're going to travel around. You're like there's a 50 different questions I'll ask them and then I'll give them a recommendation based on that. I'm not going to just, you know, dump out to whoever I had the juiciest affiliate links with and, and sell them the most expensive microphone that I think that their budget will allow based on the demographic data collected in their Facebook profile. So yeah, no, I, right. I don't know. I'm pretty, this seems like a bad idea. Is there a Zuckerberg bot that we can talk to? I want to go see what I can make him say. <laughs> right. yes. Isn't that the funny thing, too? It's like it's always like, what can we make the bot say? Yeah. Not like what is what is the information that the bot is trained on more like how can we make it hallucinate? Look, look Zuckerberg, how can I be if a, it's a Zuck bot, Please I mean, tell me. clearly yeah. people are going to want to do that. Yeah. Well, if you have thoughts on this, uh, and you probably do, uh, you can join our conversation in our Discord. Lots of people in our Discord all day, every day. You can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. See you there. Well, as we are all creators, as we've said, uh, it can be somewhat tedious to post and publish and create art across multiple platforms that you have a presence on. You want to make sure people see your stuff, you're proud of it, um, but it ends up being a lot of work. That relates to social media accounts, RSS feeds, everything in between. So Will, you may potentially have a solution because I know a lot of people uh, are, are, are kind of uh, sweating, sweating, sweating these days, uh, trying to be creators who do all the right stuff. So what do you think? Yeah, it's it's we had a we did an episode about this a couple of weeks ago with our friend Wes Fenlon, who's over at PC Gamer. Uh, he was talking to me about indie web stuff, and I wasn't really familiar with it. And and he said, "Look, there's a whole bunch of like the web is back, right? That's that's it's kind of where we started this conversation." And then we we got into it. And I was like, "Oh, okay. So like, what does that mean? It means that the people are posting stuff on blogs because they want to own their own content." And then to get it discovered, they share that out simultaneously across a bunch of different platforms like Twitter, you know, old Twitter and Blue Sky and Mastodon and Threads and all the different places that, that you post things these days. Uh, and that that uh, led to a conversation about 
POSSE, which is an acronym for Post Once Simultaneously Syndicate Everywhere. Uh, it's an indie web mm -hmm. concept. And and the idea is really straightforward, is that you have a blog someplace where you own the content, you own everything that you post, and you're the one who controls it because you own the domain and the host and, and all that stuff. And then the blog just handles all the hard part of, oh, I need to, okay, I did a blog post, now I got to do a threads post, and I got to do a Twitter post, and I got to do a co-host post, and I got to do a Blue Sky post, and I got to do a Mastodon post, and I got to post on the gram, and I probably should do a YouTube short, and like, I don't think it's the YouTube shorts, but... It's a lot of work, it turns out. I mean, you yes, guys know yes. it, it doesn't seem like that much, uh, but but there's a lot to it. Um, and, and there's a whole bunch of work happening in this space, and it's mostly by the kind of nerds that are smart enough to write the code to handle all this work. And then they're also smart enough to not post it and make it a publicly available thing so that they have to end up maintaining it indefinitely and getting yelled at by people. Uh, the good news is if you have just a normal blog and you have RSS, you can get about 90% of the way there using either FTTT or this thing called Bridgy, which is a, um, they're both services that basically will take an RSS feed and blast out the stuff that goes on the RSS feed to yeah. social media using specific rules. So, so okay. So you mentioned uh, IFTTT, if this, then that, um, and uh, which is something that I've used in the past um, to, you know, sort of like Yahoo Pipes. Remember yeah. Yahoo Pipes? Yeah, uh, man, I love pipes. Yeah, um, same idea where you're kind of like, okay, here, here's my content, and I want my content to do the things in these different ways uh, in, in, you know, these various other platforms that my content is connected to. Mm -hmm. There are other options besides Posse. So how does Posse make this that much easier? Well, so um, the idea is that it's, it's, uh, there are basic, basically some rules, right? So Bridgy uh, does this thing where it looks at the type of content that you're producing. And Bridgy does more than just the posse side of this. It does, it will pull comments that are on a social media post back onto the blog so that like all of the conversation about your post ends up in the same place, right? Um, but the but the posse idea is there's two types of text posts on the web. There's, there's like a blog post, which has a headline, and then there's a deck and there's, you know, uh, written content. And that goes to certain places. But then there's also just these short posts that are like that started out on Twitter and now are kind of everywhere too. So mm -hmm. it, it kind of automatically sorts by that. You can even go so far as to like some people have built blog front ends that give you a place to write the short post that goes with a long blog that then links back to it so that it, it does that. It, usually they're aware of things like uh, hashtags on like hashtags are really important on threads because you need to have people mm -hmm. in the right conversations. And it, it manages all that stuff for you because like the FTTT example is good, but it's a little janky in that it just takes the same text and the link that you put in it and blasts right. it out to everything right regardless of whether it's the right format for the for the different media type stuff like that so well and i think and i think part of the problem that uh creators have even if they want very badly to you know i've made a new video i want this to go out onto every platform in the world is if it all is the same content then you get diminishing returns because your audience is like eh, i already saw this somewhere else well i mean there's two there's two answers. Like, there's, I have two minds of that. Cause yeah, you're absolutely right. Like, you want your TikTok videos. TikTok has a different vibe than YouTube shorts, even though they're both vertical videos that are like a minute long and, and usually there's some music there. You, but, but at the same time, if I'm making a podcast and I don't have a newsletter and blog posts and um, social media posts directing people to that, then I'm missing, I'm only getting to the people that listen to podcasts, right? And there's people who don't listen to podcasts, but love newsletters and the people who don't like podcasts or newsletters, but read RSS feeds. And like, yeah. as an indie creator, I have to go out and, and like actively reach out and, and find all of those people, I think. Well, so. it sounds kind of like a like a buffer or, or or a hype fury on steroids. I've used these applications to where I want to post on on it used to be Twitter and also Instagram and also LinkedIn. And I would just write one time in one application and would go push it out to these multiple places. This I, I like this. I like this implementation a little better. I can write in a place that I own once and it'll grab it from there and then take it and put it other places. So seems pretty cool. It's something that I think I would personally be interested in. Th well, that, Rob, that especially since you've, you know, you've gotten into the, the at least podcast content game, pretty, pretty heavy over the last couple of years. What, what is your current, uh, strategy? 
I write a tweet every time I post something and then I copy and paste it into about three or four different social media platforms. Right. And, and that's where, post. that's where the so, whole, you know, right. it, it, it becomes time consuming. It's not hard, but it's time consuming. It takes time. I literally have yeah. to schedule time to do this one task right. as compared to if I could just go write one place and, you know, I don't mind spending time to create the rules, but if I can write one place, create the rules, and then it just happens in the back end without me having to manually do stuff, that would be awesome. Yeah. Well, and then, so the the thing that's happened as a result of all this, all these tools getting good is that there's an explosion of new blogs. There's this uh, site called oo.directory that just has a ton of old school blogs. It's, it's just like, it's, it's literally like everything from like security researchers to, to, you know, daring fireball pops up there a lot, which the Mac people will know, but there's, there's, oh, it's, so it's, it's, it's not like blogs that don't exist anymore. Just blogs that had, that still proliferate and have good content current up. I mean, it's the one nice thing that's come out of the Twitter diaspora, I think is that people mm -hmm. who were like, man, I wasted all this time on Twitter and now I don't own it. And it, this bad person owns it. How do I avoid this happening in the future? And then they've gone back and started up WordPresses and yeah. started hosting their own blogs again. So it's, it's, it's a really, it's, it's exciting to me. And it gives me um, some, like in, in what felt like a dark time, it's been a positive, positive feel for me. And RSS is back because blogs are back. So I can just scroll my RSS feeds again like it's 2008 and Google Reader still exists. Which What's is, old is new? Nice. What's yeah, old is new again? You know, you just it Google always Reader. comes back around. I love it's it. You know, check out my web app. ring. Uh, it's uh, indie <laughs> podcasts. Uh, yeah, no, uh, web rings are not back yet, just to be clear. But I'm sure they're coming. <laughs> yeah, they might. Yeah, who yeah. knows? <laughs> it's right around the corner. Um, well, well, thanks so much for, um, you know, it, uh, sparking some, uh, I, I think, probably interesting ideas for those of us who are creators and also people who consume creative content and the, the tools that we all have to to kind of kind of go back to the old days in a way. But, you know, in modern times. All right. Let's look now at the mailbag. This one goes to Tom, uh, Tom Merritt. You've probably heard of him. Um, this is from Jeff in Knoxville, Tennessee, who says, Tom, nice job on your recent know a little more about GPUs. Nicely done. I've uh, spent more of half of my more than half of my career career working on GPUs primarily for scientific computing and supercomputing. But I still learn things about the pre NVIDIA technologies from your research. It's always a bit exciting when an episode comes out that I already know a good bit about because I love that you're raising awareness of what I do every day. Yeah, so uh, just a little reminder that Know a Little More is part of the uh, DTNS um, family, um, and you definitely should check it out. Tom does a very, very deep dive on a variety of subjects on a regular basis, and yeah, thank you to Jeff. Uh, always nice to know when... Something strikes a chord, so to speak. So definitely thanks to Jeff and also thanks to you, Will Smith, for joining us. It's been a pleasure having you on today. Why don't, why don't you tell us what you've got going on and where people can find you? Yeah, thanks, Rob. Uh, you can find me at Brand Will Made a Tech Pod. It's techpod.content.town. We did a full episode about the other side of the posse phenomenon, the reading everywhere with RSS, how to set up your own Google Reader service, basically oh, nice. called Fresh RSS. Uh, that's a thing you can run on, run on your NAS or a small machine or host on a Linode or something someplace. And like you, now, instead of doom scrolling Twitter, I load up my RSS reader and I scroll stories from people whose articles I'm excited to read instead of being bummed out all the time. So it's a it's a good thing. Uh, and we do new episodes every Sunday. Yeah, you know, we talked about the IntelliMouse Explorer last week. So why why was that an important mouse? Well, you'll have to listen to find out. Oh, I love it. Yes, there is life on the other side of doom scrolling, everybody. <laughs> you know, the internet will 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 get there. Uh, patrons will get there uh, with your support. Thank you so much for supporting us. Do stick around for our extended show, Good Day Internet. Today we're talking about if you use transportation other than your own vehicle and you say, no, I don't. Well, would you if you got paid for it? Uber would like to know. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at DailyTechNewsShow.com for Slash Live. We'll be back tomorrow discussing how bats track their prey and how that can help us improve detection sensors with Blair Bastridge and Lynn Peralta. The DTNS family of podcasts. 
helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>